This morning we're going to be looking at a text in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4, if you would turn there with me in your Bibles. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. As you turn there, I, I just have to say, as would be with any text, but it just seems with this text as I've been studying it, I don't know if it's possible to exhaust all of the beauty from this text or even extract all of the meaning because there's just so much there. And so truly, I, I, I just come as a, as a beggar before God that he would use me and, and put on display Jesus Christ. That's my heart this morning, and I pray that we would see him lifted up in this text. So um, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll read the text together if you join me. Father, you are so good to us, Lord, and just as we, as we sang, Lord, your grace is greater than all of our sin. Lord, our sin which mounds over, and yet, Lord, in your grace, you have, you have saved us. For at the cross, truth and mercy met, and there we find redemption in Christ. Lord, you say in your word, we were not redeemed by corruptible things like silver or gold passed down from the aimless conduct of our forefathers, but that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so, God, we come to Christ this morning. We humbly submit ourselves to the one who paid it all on our behalf. So, God, would you please just minister to our hearts this morning? Minister to each individual in this room, Lord, please. Let them not leave here having not tasted of the glories and the riches of Jesus Christ. Lord, please take me out of the way. Let this be all about Christ. Let me just hide behind your beautiful and glorious word as it does its work, its faithful work to pierce hearts here this morning. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd read with me in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Well, as we pick up in this text this morning, I think it's always necessary to establish our context, our background into the book of Colossians. And so, just a little bit of background to kind of get us into this text. The church at Colossae began during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus, We know that Paul did not actually start the church of Colossians, the Colossae, but rather a man by the name of Epaphras, who was actually saved during Paul's visit to Ephesus. And the little we know about this man, Epaphras, is that he was a very godly man. It's one of those guys that I just, I look forward to meeting in glory because he's just so, so humble. We don't know a lot about him other than from this text here. He's fearful though, as he comes to Paul, he's fearful because there's a dangerous heresy that's rising up in the church. And so we're told that Epaphras makes the long jersey from Colossae to Rome, where Paul is, and there he's a prisoner. And he has a deep concern for the people. And so he sought Paul's wisdom and encouragement in how to address the issues that are plaguing this church. What was the heresy? Well, it was a man-made religion, and it contained elements of Gnosticism, which was the idea that God is good, but matter is evil, that Jesus Christ ultimately was simply an emanation from God and was therefore less than God, and ultimately that would give rise to the idea of of Christ was not really a human, denied his humanity. It was the belief that there was a higher knowledge above Scripture that was necessary for salvation. There were elements of Jewish legalism in the heresy. Things like the necessity of circumcision or the adherence of ceremonial law in order to be saved. 
It called for worship of angels and other mystical experiences. Asceticism was another aspect of this heresy, which deal with the idea of severe discipline and, and avoidance of all forms of indulgence. It was, it was just, it was hyper-legalistic. I mean, beyond what we know and, and, and Epaphras' concern for this church. So I didn't want to see the gospel adulterated in this way, so he goes to Paul. Well, the book of Colossians has a similar structure to most of Paul's letters. Paul begins with doctrinal truth and he leads into imperative, the living out of these truths. It's in Colossians 1 that we get some of the most beautiful truths about Christ. We learn about his deity. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, we're told in Colossians 1.15. His preeminence. He's before all things. And in him all things hold together, Colossians 1.17. We learn of his headship over the church. He is also head of the body, the church, Colossians 1.18. His redeeming nature. He reconciles all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20. And we learn of his victorious death in Colossians chapter 2. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Christ is at the center of this book. If there's ever a book to display the sufficiency and fullness of Christ, I think you can make an argument that it's here in the book of Colossians. At least I believe that after, after studying this past week. And where we pick up this morning is the continuation of these great truths into the practical living of the Christian life. This is about living our lives consistent with these truths. Because as one pastor puts it, faith is a faith that functions. And it's because of these incredible truths that we can live in such a way. It's these truths that must motivate us in our daily walk with him. Living this lifestyle is first discovering the source of life. Well, liberal Christianity today holds to the external realities without true belief. That's why we see so much faltering and wavering going on in the world because we're compromising the truth of who Jesus is and when we do that, it affects the way we live. So as we pick up this morning, we must see it through the lens of Colossians 1 and 2. As we read in Colossians 3, see it through that lens. What have we already seen in Christ? May our practice follow suit with our position is the call this morning. Well, we pick up in, in verse 1, and we get a familiar word. If you're reading out of the NASB, you see that word, therefore. Therefore. In the ESV, it's, it's omitted. I'm not quite sure why, to be honest with you. It may be because of redundancy with the next word to come, given that it's, in the fir it's a first-class condition. But in the NASB, we see the word therefore, and that's kind of become a buzzword here at Southside. <laughs> Ken said, I need a shirt that just says, therefore. I think that's, that's fitting. It's true. We've kind of been brainwashed here at Southside in a good way. So when we see that word, we ask the question, what is therefore, therefore, right? It's a good question to ask. So we always, we always go back to the previous verse or even the previous passage to help inform our understanding of the, the present text. And so you can make an argument to go all the way back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. You can even go back further. Some may say to go to verse 16. I'm just going to read verses 20 through 23 just to kind of set our immediate context. Uh, Colossians 2, 20 through 23. If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why as if you were living in the world do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So the previous passage deals with sin and I think it's safe to say that there's a link here. It deals with the, the man-made religion which gives a false appearance of holiness. It almost feeds the flesh and is therefore of no use against the fight of sin. But what Paul is going to show us in this passage today 
is that the true fight against sin, and more generally, the true practice of a Christian is participating or walking in the reality of union with Christ. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. What does union with Christ look like? And how does union with Christ motivate us then in our daily walks as Christians? Perhaps you've heard it said, we are not concerned about religion, but we're concerned about a relationship. We're concerned about a living, walking, abiding relationship of union with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's living the eternal life, which begins right here and right now. John MacArthur has said, it's not so much quantity when we're talking about eternal life, but rather quality. Does your life have a new quality to it then? Is there a new focus about your life? I just want to grow in this relationship with Christ. And Paul's going to ask that very question to the Colossian church. We get this glorious text, and what's to follow is this putting on of Christ. Sinclair Ferguson says, The greatest expression of our submission to Christ is our obedience. And that's really what chapter 3 is is all about. Again, the living out of this faith. In a more practical sense, this text deals with our disposition as believers. It deals with our minds, our thoughts, our attitudes. There's a heavenly mindedness that we're called to in this text where our our thoughts ascend beyond this world into the throne room of Christ. And it's this heavenly mindedness that motivates our actions. The Puritans frequently spoke to this reality when they said that the mind stirs our affections and our affections in turn cause the acting out of our wills. In Romans 12, 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Philippians 4, 8, we read, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So that's all in the way of introduction. I think I'm rivaling you in introductions here. Five more minutes, minutes. here we go. (laughs) Three points, three points as we open up the text this morning then. Number one, our position in Christ Number two, our passion as believers. And number three, the promise from God. So first, we'll look at our position in Christ. And the text says, if. If. As I said before, this is a first-class condition. The argument Paul is making is based on assumption of reality. Some may then translate that word if as since or because. Since you have been raised with Christ. Raised with Christ. That's an incredible phrase. What does that really mean? We hear it a lot, I think, in Christian statements. It's almost part of our Christian vocabulary, maybe a default prayer. But have you really pondered the magnitude of that statement right there? If you have been raised with Christ, really, have you, have you considered that? This is an objective reality right now for the believer. You have been raised. Romans 6 parallels this passage well, I think, as we read, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We have been united with Christ in his resurrection, and there is now a new quality, therefore, to our lives. We are no longer defined by our sin, but are now defined by righteousness because we have been raised with Christ. You've been made alive together with him. If I've been raised with Christ, then my citizenship, therefore, is in another place. I have a new hope, new security, new confidence in this present world. Now, that's, that's something to meditate on. 
Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 4, a familiar passage We've been studying out of 1 Peter. He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Believer, do you understand your position now? Positionally, you are seated with Christ. That's where our blessings are where our inheritance is, and where our affections ought to be. This is where we enjoy fellowship with God. It is this place where divine revelation has been dispensed, where praises and petitions go, where Christ intercedes and sends the Spirit to minister to hearts, and we are seated with Him in such a place. Have you tasted of this place, believer? Have you beheld the glory of Christ this morning? Sinners forgiven. And granted eternal life in Jesus Christ, you have been raised. And what Paul said earlier in chapter 1 is that you are now qualified in Christ. We live in a world that begs for acceptance. As one pastor says, a world where Satan is constantly committing identity theft. And innate in our own being, there's a longing to be known and accepted. And what we're told here in this text is that Christ, in Christ, you are fully known, fully loved, and fully accepted. And our confidence is that you have been united with him in his death and in his resurrection and are now seated with him. This is why there's no such thing as a boring testimony, right? You hear that sometimes? Well, I was raised in a Christian home and and then I just, I came to faith. I don't really know when it was. It wasn't that radical, but there, there's no such thing as a boring testimony because we're talking about resurrection here. You are with Jesus in the heavenly places. You are living in the supernatural every day, new creatures. I mean, we are walking miracles as believers. It's miraculous, is it not? First, you died as we're told in, in Romans and in Galatians, we'll even see that in this text. And after that, you rose and you took on eternal life when you were made alive together with Christ. And at that moment, at that moment, you were raised up and your mind was opened to a new perspective. You became aware of God and all that he desires for your life. And what absurdity then having been raised with Christ and all of his infinite beauty to turn back to this world. Within this context, this is what Paul is saying. Man-made religion always tells you to just look back at yourself. You're constantly in this place of comparing yourself to a measure that you cannot meet. That's what legalism is. And the gospel call to us is to look to Christ who did all of the work. He, he finished the work. And we've tasted of this heavenly glory. And yet we turn back to this world. Illustrations always fall short and I'm really not great with them at all. But imagine yourself, hungry for years. All you have to eat is the spoiled leftovers, maybe from a fast food restaurant or something like that, and you're just diving through a dumpster, right? You're just grabbing anything you can find. And then you're offered a feast with a prominent king. I won't use the president because I'm not sure if that would be that appealing to very many people. But imagine this with me. This king says, I will serve you the richest and the juiciest melt-in-your-mouth steak that you will ever have. I don't know much about steak, but I know a filet mignon is really good. So let's just imagine a filet mignon. If you're you're vegan or something like that, imagine a really good kale salad, (laughs) all right? Just Just so we're all on the same page here. But he says, no strings attached, no strings attached. The invite is free, and you enter into this glorious palace 
of the king, and you sit at this table, and you enjoy a nice appetizer, maybe some, some good bread or Brussels sprouts or something like that, and then all of a sudden, when the steak is about to be served, you get up and you leave, and you return again to the streets, and you run to the nearest McDonald's, and you go to the nearest dumpster, and you eat a spoiled hamburger. What absurdity. Anyone in their right mind would would shake you and say, what are you thinking? You have all of this and you would replace it with that? And you see why we are to consider our position. To be reminded of our standing before God if we long to have any lasting victory over sin. You have a place at the king's table with your name on it and a juicy steak right before you. That's the promise here, the gospel. Why would we turn back then? Why would we turn back? What absurdity. We're jumping around a little bit, but we're going to jump to verse 3 just to give us a greater understanding of this position that we have with Christ. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Again, the verb tense indicates that our death is of the past. That when we apprehend Christ by faith, then our old self has already died because it died with Christ on Calvary's tree. What happened to Christ historically and finally and unrepeatedly has been applied to me once and for all and in all of its fullness. Again, Colossians 2.13 in the previous chapter reads, My certificate of debt consisting of decrees against me was hostile to me, has been taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. In Christ, that is in our union with Christ that God established, we have died. We have died. Died to what, you may ask? died to sin, both in its guilt and in its power. And it's a decisive and it's an instantaneous blow, meaning sin no longer has dominion over you, for you have died. You have been set free, believer. This is the foundation for our warfare then, for our living out the Christian life. This is where we begin. You have died with Christ. You've been set free. And in verse 3b, Paul says, my life is now hidden with Christ in God. I think this has many meanings, but I'll just hit three of them. First, my life is hidden with Christ. I now participate in the common blessings of spiritual life with Christ and with the Father. That same union that they have, I now get to participate in with them. My life is hidden with Christ and God. <laughs> that is amazing. Secondly, my, my spiritual life is secret. The natural man cannot comprehend this new life that marks me. I think that's fitting, especially with the verse to come. There's almost a sense of vindication. When Christ appears, I shall appear with him. And so my life is hidden. My spiritual life, it's, it's secret. And thirdly, my life is hidden with Christ. I am now eternally secure in Christ. I am now eternally secure in Christ. That's one of the great promises, I think, for the believer. I love that. My life is secure in Christ. I'm safe in the arms of my Savior. And nothing in this world can touch me or strip me from him. I am wrapped up in him. Philippians 1, he will perfect this work which he has begun in me. It's the promise from God. I'm eternally secure in him. On January 8th, 1956, Jim Elliott and four other missionaries sought to bring the gospel to the Huarani Indians in Ecuador. Many of us have probably heard the story, but perhaps you didn't know this. In the minutes before embarking on this incredible quest, they sang a song And the song was entitled, We Rest on Thee, the words which mark this glorious reality that my life is hidden with Christ. Listen to these lyrics. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. 
We go not forth alone against the foe, strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender. We rest on thee, and in thy name we go. As Jim Elliott and the other missionaries neared the coast and stepped from their boat, they were brutally killed, speared to death by the natives. But God was supposed to protect them, right? They sang about God's protection, my shield and my defender, and he allowed them to be killed. Well, behind them, they left four wives, one being Elizabeth Elliot, who we probably know best, and she spoke about the loss of her husband. And she quoted from Psalm 91.1. This is, this is beautiful. Which says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And she then said, This is where Jim Elliot, my husband, was slain. In the shadow of the Almighty. His life hidden in Christ protected and safe all the way to the arms of Jesus. God protected Jim Elliot and the others that day. He protected them from faithlessness and discouragement. He protected them from the desire to hold to their comforts rather than to hide their lives in Christ. And that's the promise to the believer. My life is hidden with him where he is my refuge in all circumstances and avenues of life all point back to him. I am united with Jesus Christ. Nothing can therefore touch me or strip me of him. There's eternal security for the believer. And as you know, the story does not end there. There was a massive revival among these Indians, the Hurani Indians in Ecuador, and many of them were saved as a result of these men's sacrifice. Well, our second point this morning is our passion. First, our position. And it gives rise to our passion as believers. It's this kind of union that necessitates communion with Christ. It demands it. These are not just facts about Christ and now I can resolve to walk in obedience. That would be to miss the beauty here. You have been united with Christ And this is to transform our daily walk. This is to be our preoccupation as believers. And look at at verse 1b with me. Keep seeking the things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This is in the continuous imperative form, which means it's an ongoing action. And this is to mark our daily lives. Make this a pattern of your life. This is not just some mystical experience of ascending into a different realm and some sort of like contemplative thinking or something like that. It's so much more than that. And what Paul is saying is, let your preoccupation be with heaven and let that then control your earthly responses. Well, what is our fixation in seeking the things above? Notice the object of our focus where Christ is, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's where Christ is that our attention is to be drawn. Jesus is the one I seek. And please recognize with me who this Jesus is. He's the infinite one, the holy one, the righteous one. He's he's not one to grow bored with because his glory is inexhaustible. His beauty is incomprehensible. If you have come in here this morning with any sense of boredom in your pursuit with Christ, then we've got to repent. We've got to repent. I have to repent of this every day. Lord, restore again the joy of my salvation. Every day, I have to ask God to give me this confidence again and my right standing before him to restore this joy of my salvation. We can't grow bored of him. We're told that he, Christ, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, the firstborn over all creation, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. This is the Christ whom we are to dwell upon. Has he lost his beauty to you when you first believed? Maybe it's because you've deprived the relationship. 
that you've placed it with something else. You've replaced it with something else. And maybe it even appears to be something good, like ministry. Don't lose the intimacy with Christ. One man who I look up to very much told me that after running so hard in ministry, he just had to pause from it all and just took time and he went before the Lord and he just confessed and he said, Lord, I miss you. Lord, I miss you. And maybe that's our hearts this morning. Lord, I I miss you. I've replaced you with so many other things and maybe they even appear to be good, but Lord, I miss you. I miss that intimacy with you. This text demands our focus to be on him in whom we are united with. Hear Paul's pleading heart. Don't let the false religion deceive you. Consider all that you have in Christ. Fix your mind on these things. Seek these things with all diligence and fervor. Don't settle for that which will not satisfy and offers us no hope when you shall stand before God. Set your mind on what is sure and everlasting and unchangeable and all-powerful. Set your mind on Christ and all of his heavenly riches. That's where our hearts are to be. What does this really look like, seeking the things above? Well, Paul continues in verse 2. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. This verse qualifies the previous verse. It says it begins with our minds. This is a communing with God. Seeking God in his word and allowing his word to saturate our hearts. In order to understand these heavenly riches, we must first see them in Scripture. So how can we set our mind on these things unless we are first seeking Him in His Word? And it's not to be burdensome. It's for our good. Sometimes I need to be reminded of that. It's, a, it's cultivating a relationship with Him where He is our delight It's not just dumping water on dry soil every morning and then thinking that that's enough, right? What happens when you dump water on dry and crusted soil? Well, eventually the sun comes out and it just evaporates it out. It doesn't doesn't soak in very well. Cultivated relationship takes time. It's allowing God's word to permeate into the depths of your soul and saturate your soul with the water of God's word. There's a difference here. Tim Keller says it's, it's warming your heart to the truths of God's word, which involves time and, and constant communication. It's, it's just like our marriages. When we're saturated in God's word, it, it, it almost seems that our, our minds just sort of drift that way. And maybe you've experienced that when you're just, maybe you're driving along and, and you've just had such a sweet communion with God and you're driving and and, and sure enough, you forget why you're even driving or where you're even going. You miss your turn or whatever. If, if that's happening, it's such a glorious place to be. And that's where we're called to be. It's just, it's, so, it's, it's just automatic. Our mind just goes there. That's to be meditating. It's just, it's muttering to yourself. I think Pastor Ken has said that before. Well, waking up in the morning is not easy, is it? It's not easy to, to wake up in the morning and to, to go and be with the Lord and his word. But when we think about what awaits us, it's all worth it. Setting your mind is acknowledging your new identity and believing God's promise that there is a better world awaiting us where our savior Christ rules and reigns. And even though I'm groggy and wearied, I will believe that promise and I will fix my gaze heavenward. Well, if anyone lived in this balance, I think we could argue that Paul lived in this balance. Where it was, it was just so automatic for his mind to ascend and his thoughts to turn to Christ. Here's what he says in Philippians 1.23, for I am harassed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. That's where his heart was, just constantly in that balance. <laughs> I'm with Christ or I'm here focusing on on what the ministry is here. This is where we are to live. The things of earth have no value, no hold on me, because I keep them in proper perspective. The old song, soon and very soon, I am going to be with the king. That has to be our hope, our life in this world. 
Paul employs a contrasting imperative here in verse 2. He says, set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth, not on the things of the world. It's easy for our minds to go there, right? To focus on finances or family issues or work-related stresses. It's easy to sort of just be consumed by the monotonous, the repetitious cycle of everyday life. So it begs the question then, where, where is your mind when you're driving home and in traffic or, or doing laundry or, or feeding a baby or changing a diaper or mowing the lawn or, or putting a, a child to sleep or making di- dinner? Let this text set you free. Look beyond the task and see the eternal ramifications. Keep them in perspective. I want to be enthralled by the things above Yet the world we live in has so many outlets, so many excuses, doesn't it? Instead of deep issues of the heart, maybe it's mindless perusing of the internet on our iPhones. Or just allowing our minds to escape reality, pretending like the real issues don't exist. Listen to what Paul has to say about the world and its preoccupation. Philippians 3.19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. Well, I think the contrast is employed here to show us that we have bigger and better things to be concerned about. I mean, put that on the balance. Put that on the scale. It almost highlights the absurdity. We have Christ here and we have the world. We're talking about eternity here. Let these thoughts be what carry you through your day. John MacArthur uses this illustration. He says, if you've ever been on a mission trip, you understand this. When you get out there and you're immersed in a new culture, right? You find yourself observing, mostly because you want to get to know the culture, the people. You watch how they interact. You, you listen to their language. You watch their facial expressions and you taste the varieties of food. You even take in all the smells, whether they're good or bad. You find yourself in this state of just constant observation and awareness. And then you come back to the States. And it's amazing how quickly you get sucked right back in. The busyness takes over the conveniences which were so limited are in abundance, right? Food, showers, infrastructure, Starbucks, it's all back to normal. And life gets going. And as much as you told yourself, I'm going to live differently, you're, you're just so quickly consumed again. In the same way that missions removes us from our cultural comforts and introduces us to a new world, so this heavenly mindset is to remove yourself from the noise all around you to elevate your mind to a place where Christ is, a place above. Set your mind on the things above, not the things of earth. And our third point then, the promise of God. The promise of God. This is an already and not yet reality. We have been united with Christ, yes, but this world is not it. Amen? We've not arrived I still have flesh and battle it every day. Well, I love the surety of this promise. If you look with me at verse four, when Christ, when Christ, and it points to the coming of our King. There are eschatological implications here. You can read Revelation 19, 11 through 13 and, and be overjoyed that Christ is coming. Christ is coming and what a day of rejoicing that will be. The one who ascended returning to establish his kingdom. That's our hope. And there's a holy anticipation for the believer, a desire for his name to be vindicated, for his glory to be displayed fully and unyieldingly. There's a deep longing for his appearing in the believer's heart. 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul says to Timothy, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me also, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing this morning? Are you occupied with the future glory? I am going to be with Jesus. I mean, just total infatuation with Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Does that mark your life this morning? The text says, when Christ, who is our life. Don't miss that nugget right there. Paul throws it in there. Christ, who is your life. 
And that's, that's enough for me. That's all, that's all I need. Christ who is your life. Again, we're not only guaranteed this reality of heaven to come, but he has given us his spirit as a down payment now. And he lives in us. John Piper says, his joy, our joy. His love, our love. His peace, our peace. His strength, our strength. These are not gifts moving from him to us. They are his life experienced as our life. I think this has far-reaching implications. Maybe in even how we, we pray. Lord, Lord, help me to be more dependent on you. To live in the reality of who I am in you. To walk in the Spirit. Galatians 2.20 may be our closest parallel. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Christ is doing my living. And what do I do? I live my life in faith. I live by faith in the Son of God, which in our text is seeking the things above, setting your mind on the things above. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. I love Christian and Pilgrim's progress. When he meets Evangelist, Evangelist advised him, fly from the wrath to come. So Christian began running, crying out, life, life, eternal life. People thought he was a a lunatic, right? Maybe we, we can relate as Christians. Some friends tried to stop him, running after him. They reminded him, Uh, of all that he was forsaking. But Christian invited them to join him, explaining, all which you shall forsake is not worthy to be compared with a little of that that I am seeking to enjoy. I seek an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, and it's laid up in heaven and safe there to be bestowed on them that diligently seek it. Christian pressed on in faith. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory, our faith to become sight. Christ will appear and you, believer, will appear with him in glory. What a sweet union we have with Christ. One day to be perfected. I can't wait to see him, to to have him fully, without any interference. Well, this text bleeds Christ. It just does. You can't get away from him. If you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking in the things above where Christ is. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him. It's all about Christ. He's everything. He's at the center of the resurrection life, of eternal life. I have good news, and that news is that you get Christ. Is there anything better in this world? to see him, to dwell upon him, to behold him and all of his beauty, to be united with him. I get Christ. May this be our greatest joy this morning. And I just want to grow then in that capacity to enjoy him here and now so that when I get to glory, that capacity will be even greater and just this ever-increasing capacity to enjoy God, enjoy Christ forever in glory. We'll earnestly seek him then this morning with a persevering effort Seek him beyond the weariness and distraction. Your union with him necessitates communion with him. Drink of Christ and have a constant and abiding trust in him. Right now the world cannot see. Your life is hidden with Christ, but one day they will. One day they will see, for you will appear with him in glory. I just have four very, very quick points of application as we close. Because when you get this, I think your life changes. It just does. First, there's an inexpressible joy when we can really lay hold of these truths. I once lived in fear. Now I can live as one who has been made alive. Those those things which once were burdensome to me are now just lifted. It was said of the Puritans that they lived with with a vivacity, sort of this just lightheartedness to their, their lives. Sometimes when we think of the Puritans, we think of them as these kind of stoic, dry men, but there was a vivacity to them, just this lightheartedness to their lives. Christ said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Are you being just weighed down this morning? Perhaps gri- religion has its grip on you. Take a look above and see Christ seated in victory at the right hand of the Father. Second point of application, evangelism. 
When we have been united with Christ and have tasted of the heavenly realities, only then do you really know the emptiness of the world. Your whole perspective changes. And it takes this kind of ascension to really gain perspective into the world and their need. And evangelism becomes less of arguing your point and and making some lofty point and sounding smart and eloquent. And it becomes so much more of just pleading that simple question of, of, why are you settling for so little? Why are you settling for so little when you can have Christ? I mean, that's, the, that's what we get to have as believers. And what a great promise. Third point of application, our fight against sin. False religion points to, to self-reliance. It points to legalism. Well, true victory comes from union with Christ because I have ascended and I've tasted and this pleasure far surpasses any of the pleasures of this world. I've been made new. And it's this reality that must motivate us. And fourth point of application, and Pastor Ken had asked me to share a specific application to new parents because this is where Jackie and I find ourselves. We have one now. We actually have one more on the way. Um, parenting is hard. It just is, Right? Every parent here should be saying amen. Parenting is difficult. For the first time in your life, you have someone that is totally dependent on you. I mean, that's that's unreal. You can't prepare for that. There's no sort of checklist or or instruction manual that you can have to, to read up on parenting. The responsibility is huge. And so often, it's loneliness, I think, that accompanies parenting. It just is. It's lonely, especially for the moms. I mean, the moms are the real heroes here. Dads, we just get a, a few hours every day. They're with the child every, every day, all hours of the day. And your life sort of begins, it, it just sort of ebbs and flows with the mood of a baby. Now, I'm speaking specifically to babies, right? But, but you just kind of live in that cycle of eat, sleep, poop, spit up, teeth, get sick, bonk their head, throw a temper tantrum, and then it starts all over. I mean, that's kind of the life of a baby, and where Jackie and I find ourselves now is in this, this battle for Hudson's will, which is a, a gentle way of saying we're having to exercise a lot of discipline. Um, one guy, I won't say his name, he said they're, they're just like, they're like vipers in a diaper. Um, I, think, I think that's true. You're like, they're so cute. And then you get to know their, their hearts and their depravity. It's precisely in those moments, though, in the repetitious grind of parenting, that you can just, you can, you can, you can feel so alone. You even begin to doubt the efficacy of of what you're doing. Is this really working? Well, our union with Christ allows us to look beyond the moment, beyond the present circumstances, and see the eternal implications of what you are doing. I am fighting for your soul, is the point here. I'm fighting for your everlasting joy in Christ. And the monotonous routine then becomes a purposeful quest for these realities, which we've just studied to be true in that little tiny heart for them to one day embrace Jesus as their Savior. And so you can just see how, this, how a text like this, when we're set in our minds, it just transforms everything. It's our unity with Christ that has to motivate us. And as we go from here, I, just, I would just ask just this week, just ponder the significance of what your position is now in Christ, that I've died with him, I've been raised with him, my life is hidden with him, and one day, I am to be revealed with him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that um, in Christ we have everything and that you're constantly showing us that in in the scriptures. And Lord, it, it seems so often that our minds are just so separate from our hearts. So God, I'm just, I'm just begging you that these truths would not just be of the mind, but that they would make their way to our hearts and they would cause us to live lives that are obedient and submissive to Christ, that we would live lives as as those that have been made alive in Jesus Christ. Lord, please be with all of us as we go from here, Lord, and help us to, to, to model our lives after the one who perfectly lived and who died and who's now seated at your right hand. It's in that precious name that we pray, amen.